Hi there guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thanks so much for joining me. Now in this video, we're gonna be looking at the second of our videos into the nature of sleep. In this one, we'll be looking at factors which affect sleep. So basically, all the different things you can do to either give yourselves a decent night's sleep or ultimately that make you less likely to have a decent night's kip. So let's get straight in. First guy we're going to look at on the right hand side here is a guy called Peter Tripp. Now in the 1950s Peter Tripp was a radio DJ and for a charity event that he called a wake -a he decided to stay awake or rather to see if he could stay awake for 200 hours. That is an incredible amount of time. It's almost 10 days straight. It's absolutely you know, about 8 days straight or so. Absolutely incredible. Now what actually happened here was Peter very very quickly entered into a state of extreme sleep deprivation. Now you guys don't know what this means. If you've even missed a few hours sleep, maybe you've only gotten maybe two or three hours of a night or something like that, then you have a loss in concentration, you find it very difficult to stay switched on, and you also have a loss in mental agility. Next time that you are lacking any kind of sleep, you've had a really poor night's sleep, see if you can even do basic things. You'll struggle to do things like mental addition and to spell words. That's what we mean when we say mental agility. But that's just a couple of hours sleep that you're missing. What would happen if it was 200 hours that you were missing here? Well, Peter Tripp, what happened? went through a series of stages of delirium. This is basically the first stage of psychosis. He started hallucinating, he started speaking to himself, he started twitching, and um, he began to see people as if they were wearing furry women's suits, which is very strange. He started drooling, he couldn't stop that. Every time he opened a drawer, he thought that his hands were on fire. And ultimately, he believed that he was an alien living inside his own skin. Now, these are severe mental conditions. Obviously, this is absolutely a massive psychological trauma that he's going through. And ultimately, he went to sleep at the end. He slept for a couple of days straight and then was fine. So sleep deprivation can be really, really severe, but it seems to be quite temporary. With this in mind, however, if you keep people awake for even a little bit, a couple of days perhaps, then the amount of psychological anguish they go through is pretty incredible. The CIA nowadays use sleep deprivation as a type of psychological torture. Now, physical torture has long since been outlawed. You can't really uh, physically harm someone, at least not permanently. Psychological torture, however, yeah, absolutely. They can do that all the time. And the way they do that is very cruel. Normally what they do is they play Barney the dinosaur over and over again to these poor, poor people. I, to be honest, I can think of very few things worse. I'd, I'd prefer the physical torture than that, to be honest with you. So that's sleep deprivation. Let's talk about some of the factors affecting sleep now. And the first one that we're going to speak about are drugs. Now, what we mean here are both legal and illegal drugs. We can split them into roughly three different groups here. The first of which we'll look at are the stimulants. Now, a stimulant drug has the effect of making people more alert or keeping them awake or at least it reduces the quality of sleep. I, for example, I really, really need my cup of tea in the morning. When I get to work, I need that cup of coffee as well. I have a dependence on that and it kind of wakes me up because caffeine is a classic stimulant. Caffeine, however, if you drink it in the evening, it has a half-life of over five hours. So if you're gonna drink caffeine, do it early, don't do it late. Otherwise, you're gonna keep yourself awake for a long time. Amphetamine, you might be more familiar with that as the drug speed, is another type of stimulant. Uh, it is a class B illegal drug, but it's widely used in social circles, clubbing, that kind of thing. And it's even used by some workers on very long overnight shifts. The reason it's called speed keeps you awake, keeps you active for a long time. Really bad for you, so don't do it. Next class we'll look at are called the soporifics. Now a soporific is something that makes you more likely to fall asleep. Just to clarify between that and a hypnotic, a hypnotic is something that straight off puts you straight to sleep. It is the kind of hardcore version of a soporific. The most well-known soporific is alcohol. The more alcohol you drink, the more likely you are to fall asleep. 
This leads us down the path of maybe thinking of alcohol as a potential cure for insomnia. Turns out though, the more alcohol you drink, the more of a tolerance you build up to it and the less likely it is to send you off to sleep. So therefore, ultimately unlikely to be of any long-term use in treating insomnia. Short term, however, sends you right off. The last group of drugs that we'll think of are the actual prescription drugs. It's things that don't really have a direct effect on sleep, but might have a side effect on sleep. So for example, you might know that antihistamine drugs, those ones that are taken for allergies or hay fever, they normally come in either drowsy or non-drowsy versions. The drowsy versions make you very, very sleepy indeed, very, very dopey, pretty much send you straight off to the land of Nod. The non-drowsy versions obviously don't do that. So these are the side effects we have to factor in as well. The second factor affecting sleep is something that we give a German word to, and that is called a Zeitgeber. And the reason for the German word is long, we won't go into it here, but basically the word Zeitgeber means time giver. So it refers ultimately to environmental signals or triggers, if you like, that in some way affect your circadian rhythm. It gives you time, it sets your watch, your internal clock, if you like. So it kind of makes our brain think that it's either time to fall asleep or it's time to wake up. Now there's a few of these, day length might be one of them, but the main one here is light and darkness. So in our evolutionary past, we would start to feel sleepy as soon as the day starts to get late and it gets darker. Similarly to that, as soon as it starts to get light again, that's when you're supposed to wake up. Nowadays, of course, we use artificial lights and we often stay awake or get up when it's still dark outside. So electric light has now become our main zeitgeber. Now, this leads to some pretty concerning research. The more blue light you subject yourself to, blue light is very high intensity light. It comes off iPad screens and phone screens and that kind of thing. The more blue light you expose yourself to, the more you're gonna keep yourself awake. And it does this by suppressing the sleep hormone that we call melatonin. Very, very grim. You don't want to be using your iPad too late at night, at least if you want to have a decent night's sleep. The last one, the last one rather, that we'll look at here is kind of coming into it, it's noise and anxiety. Now, noise is pretty straightforward here. Most people prefer silence or close to silence to fall asleep. I myself, very light sleeper, can't sleep if there's any noise at all. But once you are in stage three or stage four of NREM sleep, Turns out noise isn't really much of a factor. Even if there's something playing in the background or someone walks in and says your name, chances are you're not really gonna hear it. Remember, in stage three and stage four, that slow wave sleep, your brain pretty much is dead to the world, not really much uh, of the input from outside filtering through, so it doesn't matter how much uh, noise is going on there. But it's still a factor if you're falling asleep, so we still have to take account there. The other thing is anxiety. Now, when you are alone at night or at least in the darkness by yourself, you're staring at the ceiling, that's when stress starts to play on you. You might have had this before with maybe exams or something you're worrying about. Could be family worries, could be money worries or debts to pay or something like that. When you are alone at night in the darkness, that's when stress kind of switches up to maximum and it can result in pretty severe insomnia. It makes it very difficult for you to switch off. For some reason, Bryce in this piece of research um, believes that it's more of a problem in middle-aged women. So not so much of a problem for teenagers, but it seems to be a problem the older that you get. So something else to take into account there as well. Key concepts then guys, we're pretty much finished with the nature of sleep now. So here's some more to add to our video from last time. Remember that DJ Peter Tripp the wake 200 hours awake and ended up believing he was living inside his own skin as an alien. Pretty grim. Drugs, especially stimulants such as caffeine and amphetamine, can make it more likely that you're going to stay awake, less likely that you can drop off at all. Think about prescription drug side effects as well, guys, especially things like antihistamines, which can make you very, very drowsy. Zeitgebers, that's the time givers. In our case, that's light darkness and especially that blue light from these electronic screens and then remember noise not too much of a factor however but anxiety certainly is these are the key concepts when we're explaining the absolute basics of sleep psychology 
Thanks very much, guys. That's everything for this video. Next video, we're going to start looking at our specific approaches to sleep and dreams, starting off with the biological approach. I hope to see you there. But until then, have a great day, guys, and we'll see you later. Cheers.